Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. You can say it in all your native languages, too. This is wonderful. What a wonderful group. Uh, first, let me thank you all for being here. I'm Ron Hollander. For those of you who don't know, I'm the executive director of the Net Research Foundation, but I have the distinct honor and privilege. Come on in. There's some more seats up front, too, um, of being the president of the International Neuroendocrine Cancer Alliance. It's a lot to say, so we say Inca. Uh, and with us today in the audience are not only the member nations uh, of Inca, we also have some other uh, uh, nations who are represented here today. I know, are the folks from Spain here? Who are, they're not here yet? Um, it, okay, great. Um, you know, it's always the people who come the furthest that come last, and no, anyway. Um, and, uh, and of course, we have guests uh, from all of those nations uh, who've participated already in a dialogue that's begun uh, with interviews, uh, with uh, a survey, and uh, for, I think, almost all of you, uh, yesterday's first ever, but first in a series of uh, a symposium, uh, symposia uh, at ENETS uh, between patient uh, leaders and medical leaders. So this is truly a very special process, and we are so pleased to have so many of you involved in it and making the time to be with us here in Barcelona. We know it's not easy to travel and uh, spend this kind of time, but uh, we really appreciate it, and this is such important work. So um, we, uh, do we have the vision slide? Can we put that up? Uh, Inca, as most of you know, uh, is an organization of, uh, 17 different countries, 20 member organizations, always looking to add additional member nations uh, to, uh, and that's our financial report from yesterday, uh, to uh, our, our, our passion for uh, bringing together uh, the patient communities globally, uh, and not just bringing them together, but bringing them together with a, a mission and a vision in mind. We see our mission, uh, ideally, as really serving as the global advocate, uh, if you will, if we can go to the mission and vision slide, uh, and to really become and work with uh, all the member nations to become the global voice for uh, neuroendocrine patients everywhere. Uh, and our vision is uh, a world where all neuroendocrine cancer patients, no matter where they live, no matter what nation uh, develop, developing, uh, what, whatever continent they live on, uh, get a timely diagnosis, the best care, and ultimately a cure. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, and we have realized early on in the existence of Inca that there's no way we're going to achieve that if we don't work very closely uh, with the people who care for us as patients uh, in all of the countries around the world. Uh, and so we're really privileged to have begun this dialogue with the medical communities, uh, ENETS in particular, starting with the symposium yesterday, uh, bringing so many of you into the conversation, including leaders, leaders from NANETS and, and COMNETS, who you'll meet in a moment, uh, my own organization, which has recently solicited and received amazing research proposals from 14 countries uh, and, and four continents around the world. We want to bring a lot of that together today to talk about what we can do together. Uh, what we can do together to uh, begin to meet the unmet needs that we've started to identify with all of your help uh, through the survey of almost 400 patients uh, and, and patient group leaders and clinicians. Uh, as well as through the interviews uh, with the, uh, the specialists and what you heard yesterday at the symposium. Uh, we have big ambitions, obviously, uh, but what we'd like to come out uh, today uh, with is a beginning of a list of, of specific things, achievable things, that we can start to do together, working uh, not just with physicians, but the, with the entire multidisciplinary team uh, and, and patient groups. Uh, to uh, advance uh, causes that start to close the gaps that are, we are identifying through these uh, surveys and through the input that you've all provided. And there are really three big questions. The big question is, how can we work together? But there are really three pieces to that question. The first is about standards of care. Uh, clearly, there's been uh, some uh, real uh, 
disparities, if you will, uh, nation to nation, continent to uh, continent, and what's available uh, to patients. So what can we do together to, to have an action plan to make a very powerful statement uh, about the needs for all patients to have access to the very best care uh, and to ensure that kind of access? Second, and you heard a lot about this yesterday, there's huge gaps in information. I don't remember, and by the way, Steve Bridges, who's uh, supporting us, who's with us here today working on the survey uh, and, and the interviews, uh, one of the most astounding things that came out of the early interviews was this disparity you heard about yesterday between what our patients, and by the way, the patients that were interviewed were some of our most involved and educated patients. They are us, they are us and people who work with our with our groups uh, in our various nations. Uh, so they are above average, if you will, in terms of their access to information. Uh, and yet still something like, was it 86%, Stephen, uh, felt that their needs were not met in terms of information. What does that really mean and what, we, what can we do to work together to begin to close those gaps for our patients? And then third, How can we work together to reach the many, many patients and those who care for them, whether they're net specialists or community doctors or others in, in, in the, uh, the, the spectrum of, of caregiving uh, who are out there? Uh, we're very proud of what we do as patient groups in terms of outreach. Uh, I know the, the centers that care for our patients do a lot trying to educate their patients and we work closely together, but there are so many. Uh, who we're not reaching. We know in America there's something like 125,000 people uh, living with neuroendocrine cancers of one sort or another, uh, and yet when we add up the numbers of the numbers of people that we reach as, as patient groups and, and look at our top centers and their volume, it's only a fraction of that number that we know are really involved in the work and, and therefore the education and support, hopefully, that they can be provided. So our purpose ultimately is going to be to try to answer these questions uh, with some concrete ideas that we get uh, not only from the medical leaders, but that really come from you. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking a minute and turn it over to the panel, but here's how we'd like to uh, spend the next uh, hour and 45 minutes. Um, we're going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what their uh, organization uh, focuses, uh, and then to also uh, shed uh, some light in just a few minutes on what they took away from uh, what they heard yesterday at the symposium. They were all there yesterday in terms of what really came back to them as something that is uh, a need that really rises above others and, and uh, uh, any other specific kind of takeaways they had to start the discussion about what we might do to uh, work together. Uh, and then we're going to throw it open. Uh, we are recording this session, so there are microphones in the room, so to the extent that you can use those, it's going to help us uh, to really capture the essence uh, of your thoughts. Uh, we are going to ask you in this early session, there's so many of us here, and I know so many of you have a lot to say about some of these issues. Uh, to keep your comments really focused in a minute or so so we can capture it, get some reaction from our panel. After they leave, and they all have to leave by 11, uh, we're going to uh, take a short break, and then we're going to break into groups so you'll all have a real opportunity to get into more depth about your ideas, uh, about specific things that we can do to follow this up, and then, of course, we'll try to aggregate all of that input uh, into some specific things that are really priorities for us, that we set some deadlines, set some timetables for working with these wonderful organizations going forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves, um, and uh, we'll get a quick statement from each of them, and uh, then we'll throw it open. So uh, Dermot, uh, our host uh, yesterday at the uh, ENET, first ever, uh, but first of many, they said yesterday, uh, joint symposiums. Please introduce yourself and your Ron, thoughts. Ron, thank you very much. Uh, the, the panel members and, and, uh, and friends and patients and, uh, and, and advocates, uh, it's lovely to be here. Dermot Atu is my name. I'm a, I've been a NETCH expert starting with Philippe Wozniewski in Paris. I went from Dublin to Paris in 1998 and I worked with him for about nine years uh, in a pancreatic sort of setup, but we had exposure to all types of NETs. So uh, this was one of the first net centers of excellence and I took that expertise and that knowledge um, back with me to Dublin, 
where I reintegrated into my family uh, of uh, physicians there, working as a gastroenterologist and gastroenterology oncologist and focusing on nets. So with time, we've built up a, a dedicated center, and uh, we've uh, just very <laughs> proudly received the Certificate for Center of Excellence. Uh, to, to, and what that is, for people don't, who don't know, that's really a, an independent auditing system where um, experts, really, really top-class international experts with an independent body come and visit your center to ensure that uh, what you say, what you put down on the paper is actually real, and they go visit, for example, the radiology department, they look at the protocols, etc. cetera. And uh, so that's, we have one of those in, 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 uh, in Dublin now, but, and that's good. And there are 42 around Europe. And our idea as part of ENETS, and I chair that Center of Excellence program, was to try to homogenize the way we um, the way we sort of meet pa patients, the way we, we consult, uh, so we don't have you know, untimely delays between when you eventually come to see us and getting the different procedures done, to look at the therapies, and, and of course also to, to examine the pathways that we use, uh, so that we call those the, the treatment algorithms, so that they're actually appropriate and we're not sort of prescribing offline and we're following the guidelines that we've established as well in Zenets and, and Nanets. So that's what, that's what we do on, on, um, on a daily basis. And of course, that is part of my, my hat for, for Enets. Uh, the, um, it, it's uh, it being involved in education, education of the young, education of the old, and uh, transforming ideas, establishing guidelines, cooperating to build a better sort of net community. And, uh, and with time, of course, you know, embracing this type of concept is, is one of the missions, of course, that, that we have. It's an evolving process. So, uh, and, and we know that the, the unmet needs that we have in the medical community, of course, they're all, um, they're all underlined by the, the frustrations that come to us from the patient. I was thinking, just as a, as a comment on, what you, on your introduction, just before I hand it over, um, I like the idea that we have to have a snapshot of what's there, because I think you have to... You know, preparing any paper or any advocacy type structure, it has to be structured. So the snapshot of what's currently there, of the unmet needs, um, it's really important to see that. And to focus on some strengths as well, and not just always be thinking about the weaknesses. So I think it's good. The awareness is something that I got from yesterday. I get it every day in my clinical practice. So if... Um, so I think the diagnosis is, is, I don't know if we can improve on a, this bullet diagnosis, but once the patient gets diagnosed and, and gets streamlined to us, so the awareness is, a, I think, is a, is, a key th is a key message, and awareness means that somebody in the community n has heard about NET and they know where to orient the patient, and I think that's one of the most frustrating things for patients and families to be diagnosed with something rare, and gosh, you know, it's a... And, and European, the European Commission is trying to increase that with their, with their ERN program, this European Reference Network program, and many of you are involved in that. I think the, the awareness and I think the reach, the, I would call it a net reach, a net reach out is, to, is another um, concept, but it's reaching out, we often think, to areas that are underprivileged in terms of financial aid, etc. but even within our own groups, we've, you know, that that's important as well, and I think the other thing I like it is also to unify, to unify the unify the the forces that are there. You know, we've got nanets, we've got we've got um, the comnets, we've got so many people, and, and I know that we touched on this yesterday. We touched with David as well and George, and and I think that working together and working with Inca with all of the other groups will be the way forward. That's the way I think. Hi. My name's Eva Segalov. I'm a professor of oncology, just recently moved from Sydney to Melbourne in Australia. Um, and I'm very proud and privileged to be here today on uh, behalf of uh, my co-founder of Comnet, Simron Singh, who sends his apologies. So about three years ago, we were um, talking about the fact that the European model of ENETS um, in terms of uh, education was outstanding and as was Nanets and, and we really felt there was no need to duplicate that. But what we wanted to set up was a research collaboration 
um, between communities that had similarities. So Canada, Australia and New Zealand have somewhat similar health systems, quite different to the US, different to Europe. Also issues like geography, sparse populations in um, separated where a centre of excellence uh, could be a hub but not a spoke of, of treatment. <coughs> we can't expect everyone always to travel a, a very long way. So there are issues about uh, educating and uh, researching the relationship with community um, oncologists. So we set up with, with uh, generous sponsorship from industry a uh, organisation called Comnets. Uh, we're not a society, we call ourselves a research collaboration. We live within the Australian Gastrointestinal Trials Group, which is an, our national uh, or, or Australian New Zealand um, national trials for gastrointestinal cancer. And uh, we partner with the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, which is our can counterpart. From the beginning, we decided that we didn't uh, necessarily want to have lots of members who were passive. In fact, everyone in our group is an active collaborator researcher. And we also wanted to embed patients in our group, so not as external consultants, not as um, some sort of stakeholder outside the group, but actually within the group. So we had our first meeting in 2015. Um, the unfortunate reality of geography is that uh, if you go midway between Australia, New Zealand and Canada, you end up in Hawaii. So uh, we, we have our annual meeting in Hawaii. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and we have a two-day meeting where we really uh, workshop um, projects. Our initial project was a modified Delphi process to look at gaps in neuroendocrine research and we published that, uh, our gaps analysis last year and that's our blueprint for our research. Coming out of that was our project for this year which was to look at optimising follow-up for people who've got, uh, had curative resection for NETS. So many of them may not even be in your society because the, they didn't quite understand the, lo the long-term implication of NETS. They may have been told that they had something and they were cured and have no follow-up and no connection to, to NET societies. And so we partnered with uh, NANETS, um, got uh, 10 volunteers to come to Hawaii uh, and uh, did some expert uh, opinion and guidelines which we'll publish soon. So. We, our project for this year is setting up a registry across the Commonwealth countries. We'll have a patient on our steering committee as, as an important part of that project. Um, so we don't want to duplicate um, things that NANETs and, and ENETs are doing, but we're very, very keen to collaborate and to push the, re the research agenda that um, we have created, which hopefully would mimic exactly the one that you would like to create. Um, we, we're very interested in a very novel sort of uh, technique. So very, there's some very cool software called A Thousand Minds, which is uh, um, decision trade-off analysis that we're looking at. Um, and we're very interested in things like clinical trial endpoints and outcomes that have meaning for patients. So there's some of the thoughts about um, Comnets. Um, we exist on the smell of an oily rag, as do you. Uh, we're always seeking funding. We've had very good support from some industry partners, not so much from others. We are doing an Asia-Pacific preceptorship this year. Um, so we um, uh, 25 um, Asia-Pacific uh, um, NETs or people interested in NETs um, and uh, doing a mentorship program. So hopefully, um, you know, exciting things coming and uh, we're doing it very much, we hope, in partnership. Thanks. <coughs> so good morning, everybody. <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm David Metz. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist. I'm originally from South Africa, even though I'm living in the United States, where I've been 30 years. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist who trained originally 
at the NIH in a rare net called zollinger ellison syndrome, which is a, is a good overlap between <coughs> ulcer disease and neuroendocrinology. And then when I moved to the University of Pennsylvania, I uh, realized you couldn't take the one in a million or 0.5 per million incidence of ZE over to a little place in the, the Delaware Valley. And so I expanded my uh, practice to uh, nets in general. So I've been doing it for about 30 years now. At the University of Pennsylvania, we have uh, a good multidisciplinary group that gets together. We have a tumor board once or twice a month. We have about 20 members of that tumor board, which covers every discipline, uh, or almost every discipline. And uh, we really, uh, I think that that is the essential way to get good care for this rare disease. And I think that's one of the big challenges. I think ENETS has done a very good job with their center of excellence in Europe. I'm not sure that that model fits everywhere, and I think that's one of the challenges that you people are going to be facing in your discussions today, is that uh, the delivery of healthcare and the structure of healthcare and the management of healthcare across the countries of the world are very, very different, and they, that poses a lot of challenges. Uh, but I think the issue is to really get a multidisciplinary approach to management, and that, I think, is what the message should, should be. Uh, so we've been uh, working at, uh, as a, with, a, with a structure like that at Penn for about eight or ten years now. Uh, and it's not in any sort of formal design. It's really a virtual meeting uh, in that the only time we all sit in the same room together is that tumor board. But we really do share our patients. One of the big challenges in even a, a single center is to really get a good registry, a good database together. I think that's something people need to think about. Uh, you, you know, I can have 20 people looking at nets and the ways the patients all get into the hospital system is very, very varied. Uh, so I'll have my own clinical practice that might drag some patients in, but there'll be many patients there that I don't see that I probably should see, even in a place like ours. So you can imagine how it is in more peripheral hospitals that would feed in. Um, my other hat is uh, the chair of, the, of NANETS, the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, a sister society to the others. Uh, we've been going for about 10 years now. Our upcoming meeting is going to be in Philadelphia in October. Uh, it's a professional organization. It's been established for education and guidelines. Uh, the education is interesting. You know, you have a meeting like this meeting here at ENETS, which is a hybrid in that you have a lot of experts and then you have a lot of people you're trying to educate. And we've tried to approach that in a different way slightly. So we have our annual meeting, which is a professional cutting edge meeting uh, that uh, involves you know, ongoing clinical trials, uh, developing standards and guidelines, working on the future in terms of where we want to take our organization. But we've also uh, have, a, have a separate meetings. We try and do about four a year in regional areas around the US. Uh, and in the regional meetings, we really are targeting people who try and set up a center in their institution or in a city that might be a collaboration between different institutions uh, where there'll be one champion and they'll try to bring in the other specialties as well. Um, one of the difference between Europe and, uh, and the United States, I think the same sort of thing with, with uh, the Commonwealth countries, is that neuroendocrinology in the US has really been driven by oncologists. Uh, and I'm not saying there's a right or wrong way to do this, they're just different ways to, to skin the cat. But the truth is that patients enter the system through a gatekeeper of wherever it is and however healthcare is structured. And it's not necessarily going to be the oncologist who sees that patient first. So one of our limitations on the US is the baseline denominator of all those patients out there and how to feed them into the system and how to educate the general doc that's going to be seeing that patient, especially since our organization has been driven primarily by the sub-subspecialist. And how to become a sub-subspecialist for me is a big challenge. So two of the big challenges I think we are approaching and we would certainly like support and help from the patient communities is to identify how to make a neuroendocrinologist. So I'm a gastroenterologist, Dermot's a gastroenterologist, here we have an oncologist, we have another oncologist, there are surgeons, endocrinologists, generalists necessarily, it doesn't have to, where, how you get into the system isn't important but you need to have that whole picture. 
But by the same token, if you're a gastroenterologist, you want to put scopes into people. And if you're a surgeon, you want to cut. And if you're a radiation therapist, you want to radiate. So the old saying, if you've got a hammer, every, if, you've got a, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail, becomes a problem in that unless you have everybody sitting together in one place, you're not going to actually be able to deliver proper composite care across the whole spectrum of needs. So this is a long journey, and I think many of the patients uh, don't realize that in the beginning. No two patients are the same, so you've got this problem where you're trying to make guidelines and standardize therapy for diseases that arise in all sorts of parts in the body that present in all sorts of different ways. Some are hereditary, some are not hereditary. <coughs> Each patient is different. The pattern of spread is different. The density of receptors are different. The genetic differences in the tumor from Mrs. Smith to Mrs. Jones are very different. And so the challenges are truly there, and uh, I think we need to work together and collaborate in the future to sort of address all of those needs. So, you know, we collaborate with ENETs, we're collaborating with ComNets, we're growing ourselves, uh, and so the whole patient uh, approach differs amongst the, many of the professional societies. So before I hand over to George, uh, just to look at your three questions, uh, to, to make a powerful statement about the standards of care that all patients should have, I think uh, personal opinion uh, is probably quite a challenge. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd focus on trying to be practical uh, and not be too political, uh, because I think one of the problems here is from country to country there are tremendous differences. And I think we need to be careful that we're really just delivering the right sort of care. One of the things that came up in the meeting yesterday that I found quite interesting is we like to think we're very special in NETS, we're a family, we all work together, we know this is a long haul, we think we're special, but maybe we're not. You know, maybe the breast cancer group or the colon cancer group who always have much more power in lobbying because of the size and the nature of the disease, uh, they also probably feel that they own, own their area and that they're special. So uh, I think we are a true family. I, I, I find the thing that I love about neuroendocrinology is that however you enter into this field, once you've developed a fascination for this whole process, it really does feel that we're all a small family. And as time's going on, we're getting to know each other better. But I would just be wary on, on I think, what your powerful statement says. As far as the next thing in terms of closing the gap, um, yeah, the, the gap is a real problem. And I always think about when you get off the, off the, the train, mind the gap. Uh, you really got to be careful that you don't fall in the hole between the gaps. So these gaps go two ways. You're climbing on the train or you're getting off the train. Uh, and there are tremendous issues from a patient perspective and from a physician perspective. And as Ron and I have spoken, uh, I really think that this is a two-way street here. There are many, many issues that patients appreciate that we as docs don't necessarily appreciate. I think the survey has brought it out in a very, very uh, visible way. Uh, we as docs are focused more on disease. You as patients are focused more on health. You guys want to carry on with your life for the next 30 years, and we're trying to make sure we get you through the visit so that we can still have you around for the next visit in a month or three months or six months. Uh, the time and the pressures to actually deliver proper care and educate are, are very, very difficult. Uh, I have a system with my own practice is that every Friday from 11 to 1, my research nurse, my coordinator, and I sit in my office with a speakerphone, and we collect up all the people we're going to call for that week. And so we spend two hours a, day, uh, two hours a week uh, just calling people to answer questions and discuss the results and work out the next step because I am unable to see everybody once a month or once every six weeks. And I'm really seeing people and doing a lot of my care by phone, which is difficult, and, but it's, it's something that I think we have to understand is a problem and patients really need that information. So there's a tremendous gap. Uh, you know, we worrying about making sure that you're feeling well. And if, if, if you tell me you're having four stools a day and they're watery and liquid, I think, well, that's not so bad. But if it means you can't go out of your house, it's bad. And you know, one thing that came out with the most recent uh, drug approval is that reducing bowel frequency by one a day has a tremendous clinical relevant impact to patients. So 
The needs and the expectations are some, that, some things that I think we need to align. On the other hand, I think patients uh, with respect uh, are sometimes very naive about where things are ultimately going to go. And part of that is just because we say, you know, uh, this is a long chronic disease and you're going to be fine and don't worry about it. It's not a real cancer kind of thing. So the, the medical fraternity to some extent is responsible for that. But on the other hand, this is an extremely complex thing. None of us really understand this completely. There are tremendous variables that we just can't comment on, and no two patients are ever really the same. And everybody assumes that you're just going to carry on a status quo forever and ever and ever, and it may or may not be so. You know, there's a famous old slide that Arth Vinnick made uh, many, many years ago that had an asymptote in that it started off as a flat, slow, increasing line, and then as time got on, it sort of sped up. And I don't think our patients actually grasp that. It's sort of what will happen in the beginning. It's a stunning diagnosis. You have your surgery. You may think you're cured. You learn with time that you may not necessarily be. We are the guys who's telling you this is a chronic disease. Just stick with us. As each therapy comes out, we'll learn how to manage and juggle and maybe get the sequence together. But we're all going to grow old together. I love telling my patients we're going to grow old together and we're going to get gray together. But I'm gray now anyway. Uh, the problem is that things change. And understanding all those concepts, I think patients have great difficulty with, and understanding the nuances of how we're treating Mrs. Smith, I think is very, very difficult. So for me, the gap really is a two-way issue, not a one-way issue. Uh, and how do we reach the patients that we can't care for? And I think that is really a tremendous, tremendous problem. So in the United States, we have a luxury of a lot of money that we can throw at healthcare in a very ineffective way, unfortunately. Uh, we could really do a lot better with, with our GDP in terms of health care. Uh, we like to think we give the best care in the world, but let me tell you, we're only still learning about PRRT now, and it's been available in Europe for many, many years. So even in the countries that have all the resources, we don't necessarily do it well. And geographic distance is a tremendous problem uh, across for all of us. So nobody wants to drive 150 miles to come and see me, even if it's once every six months and much of it's done on the phone. Uh, and to try and set up that they get their somatostatin analog at their local doctor 100 miles away becomes in its own sense a big problem. Uh, to get information traveling even in a modern electronic area, era from point A to point B is very, very difficult to do properly. Uh, and so the whole distance care becomes a real challenge um, and the hub and spoke design works great, uh, but you know, in places like the United States where insurance controls a lot of where you go and how you go, that doesn't necessarily work out so well. So I'm getting, I'm forced to order CAT scans in peripheral hospitals, for example, and when we look at them at our institution, we say this is a scan that I don't want to even comment on, or this is a scan, but there's the mess, the guy missed it. And so in actual fact, to get your center of excellence to be a true center of excellence means everything has to be centralized in terms of monitoring. And, re, and, and the United States funding for that is a real, real difficult problem. So we, we face that all the time. We will get pathology slides and review the slides and say, well, this, is, you know, this isn't even a carcinoid. This is a, you know, a, a pancreatic cancer, and it's treated differently. So those are, those are some you know, additional problems that we as physicians face, and the poor patients are the ones that have to grab the slides and get them delivered and transfer everything all over, and that's an added, added burden. So those are some of the, the issues that, that we, we face uh, uh, on our side, but uh, this is a family, we all want to work together, and we all have the same goal, so uh, I'm very happy to be here, thank you for inviting me, and hopefully I'll be able to contribute today. Thanks, David. Um, now I know why I can't get you between 11 and 1 on Fridays. <laughs> uh, so my name is George Fisher. I'm a medical oncologist from Stanford. And, and I guess as a junior faculty, which was quite some time ago, um, I got to see all those patients that were rare and didn't fall into the categories that other physicians were doing research on. So I became the neuroendocrine person, not by any research intent, just because those are the patients I would see. And trying to build a research program myself at Stanford, a small place, um, I realized that I couldn't get pharmaceutical companies to be interested in the disease because, quote, it was too rare. 
Um, we had uh, we had to, we tried to develop a registry, uh, which in those days, without an electronic record at first, was was very difficult. Uh, I realized that this. I mean, you've heard the theme again and again: collaboration. I realized that this is not something that one institution can 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 do in any sort of quality uh, way, and so we started a neuro consumer working group within our our clinical trials consortium. So the uh, U.S. was divided into five different clinical trials consortiums. Ours was over 50 academic hospitals and associated centers, uh, associated community centers, and uh, it would have to be called ECOG, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. And that's one, that's one of the branches, one of the groups of the National Cancer Institute. So even within our networking group at ECOG, we realized that we needed a broader scope. We needed to cast a, a, a wider net in order to do proper trials. And so we formed an NCI net task force, which, rep which consists of representatives of each of the cooperative groups. So now the, all the five cooperative groups are working together, and the net task force tries to, to coordinate studies so that groups are not working at, in, in conflict. We're working on priorities that we assess and that we all work on those trials all together. So again, it's collaboration throughout uh, is, is one of the themes. Now you don't get very far if you don't have funding. So actually the reason I'm on this panel is not because of the NCI task force or, or the, uh, the cooperative group trials, it's really because I work with Ron in the NET uh, Research Foundation. And I got involved with that, you know, there, there are very few shy neuroendocrine tumor patients. There are very few meek neuroendocrine tumor patients, and, and one, uh, one such patient who started the Caring for Carcinoid Foundation grabbed me, literally, by the arm and says, you're gonna join our organization, and, and that's not something you say no to. So I joined the Caring for Carcinoid Foundation, was proud to be on their scientific advisors, and now I'm a co-chair of the Board of Scientific Advisors. We, that, that foundation is, I think, a good example of, of uh, how um, Volunteer efforts, along with some uh, scientific guidance, can lead to a, a major fundraising, a successful fundraising, to uh, fund research around the world. And, and in our last uh, request for proposals, we had around set of 16 different countries, four different continents, uh, wonderful projects. And I wish I could have funded 90% of them. There, may, there were 10% that I thought maybe not be worthy, but but that just just having that foundation brought ideas up from laboratories around the world that had never been really interested in nets before, that had different areas of expertise. So we see that as a model that we can hope to hopefully build on and really help have the net RF work with nanets, work with enets now, uh, and work with you and find ways of, of making this collaboration really a worldwide effort involving the patients, the researchers, the clinicians. Each organization has slightly different focus. NetRF is on research. Uh, the NANITS is on physician education and expanding that physician education to areas that may not have net centers nearby. And ENETS has done, is really led the way and I'm, I'm hopeful, hopefully we'll be involved with ComNets here sometime soon. So it's really all about collaboration, and, and I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for me to have been at the first collaboration between ENETS and uh, ENCA. So thank you. Okay, well, first of all, let's thank our panel for their opening statements. What a great group. <laughs> and you've already heard them put some ideas on the table for how we can start to work together on some of these issues. So we really want to get some conversation and dialogue going. We're going to ask you, if you don't mind, to step to one of the microphones so we can hear exactly what it is, your question or your comment or whatever. Uh, and uh, so let's begin that process. Again, a reminder, please, to try to keep your, make it a comment, not a speech. If it's a question, that's great. But let's try to keep it to a minute each because there are a lot of us here and we really want to get some reaction and discussion going with our medical leaders. So, so by all means. And if you could identify yourself so we all know who you are and where you're from, uh, because there are a lot of folks there. Might be easier to pass the microphone down. Is that, can we just pass that around? Okay, never mind. Hi, oh, sorry, it's my voice as well. Hi, Simone Layden from the uh, Unicorn Foundation Australia. Dermot, with the model with the centers of excellence, because obviously we're quite interested in that sort of model in our area, 
what sort of role I know that there's you've got to have specific surgery you've got to have specific access to diagnostic tools all within the same centre what role would say the patient group say for instance in any of the centres of excellence in the UK where the Net Patient Foundation would be a vital part of that accreditation process as well so that the information can be put to patients? That's a, that's a, thank you for that question. There is a, <clears throat> there is a, a more and more important role for the patient, uh, uh, for the patient group within, uh, within the, the Net Centre of Excellence uh, model. Um, it's, um, it hasn't been what we call a, a, a mandatory um, return item that we check every year, but it has come from now so that we're looking at, uh, and it's something that we've fallen down a little bit in, in Dublin, but we, it's something we're, we're looking at rectifying. What we're trying to do is to involve the patients and, and have them represented in, in, in an advocacy manner more and more, but also the sample and see what their satisfaction is with, with uh, you know, within the actual group. So really just to, we have to audit the ongoing process as well. That's a little easier than, than, than looking at something like quality of life and, and things like that. We probably will, I think, uh, down the road, uh, get to the stage where we, at the tumor board meeting, so there's, there's, there are two things. In different countries we talk about multidisciplinary team meetings and getting together one, once a month, or twi usually we do it every two weeks, and we often we do it every week now as well because we've got more and more patients. That's where we get all of the people together. So that's a multidisciplinary meeting, okay? That's what we call it in the UK. But the multidisciplinary team is the is the is the living structure that's there the whole time. So even though, you know, there's a, there's a meeting for specific items that will be discussed and problems and management and choosing therapies. You know, the team is working behind the scenes all the time to, you know, to, to get things done. But I do think at that specific meeting, I think that patient advocacy is represented. So the, so the, the physician uh, who's um, uh, with, with the nurse specialist, you know, we, we, it's, it's vital, and we audit this as well, that the, that the patient is represented in a correct way, that it's not just a problem with a disease, and we're not just looking at the disease. And that's why it's important that all of the, we don't talk about the patient unless the physician is looking after, the clinician looking after the patient is there. That's one level. But I do think that ultimately we'll get to the stage where we'd have, for example, from you know, a local or a national net group that we would have in a center of excellence model, you know, a patient representative at that type of meeting. And we have to be confident as, as physicians to to, to, to get to that level. We should strive to that as well. We're not quite there yet. I don't know whether it happens in other countries. It'd be interesting to know. Um, but it's, um, it's, um, it's a challenge to, 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 to bring that on board. But advocacy is important. And I think that for the Centres of Excellence model, we were talking about Yoshi as well, and I like David's idea. I've, we've matured. We thought we could put an in Enet's label Centre of Excellence everywhere. I don't think it was really our desire. We thought then we were getting momentum, and it was, of course, very good to do that. But the, the, the concept of getting a similar type structure, you know, and we, we've, we've tried to help out and reach out to other continents and countries to adopt a similar strategy because the principles are good. I mean, the principles are, you know, the principles in Penn, if you go there, that's what, that's what I'm hearing, you know, and obviously in Stanford as well. And I know you've got Pamela and you've got other people and many, many people around operating on the same principles for a long time. But to answer your question, I think that building it in, in, a, in, a, in a systematic uh, way into the, into the algorithms within a center of excellence is vital. And, you know, we're guilty. We have to do more of that. We, we just may have some suggestions for you by the end of the day on that too, Dermot. So, great. Eva, you had a comment on that. So I do on behalf of my colleagues in Canada, and I think you heard Leslie Moody get up and speak at the patient uh, 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 um, forum yesterday. There's actually uh, one, of, one of the um, great um, benefits I've had from our international collaboration is learning to understand systems like the Canadian one where they routinely collect on all patients, not just net or cancer patients, not only patient reported outcomes, PROMs, but patient reported experience measures. So your outcome measure is very much going to be 
related to how you're feeling from your cancer. But your experience may be very good, even if you're told very bad news, because you're going to say that was done well, or I didn't have to wait, or you know, or it wasn't done well. So we need to measure both pros and prims, and we really have the technology to do it. It's mainly iPad technology. So at my new centre, we're going to work with the Canadian <coughs> centres and try and introduce this as routine for everyone. And that, I think, is a, is a step on from the snapshot um, where, obviously, there are biases. Um, but we really, to understand, we need to use technology, we need to collect information on everyone and analyse it. And I think that, that that's the way forward. And there are certainly um, organisations like Cancer Care Ontario um, where they have a lot of expertise in, in how to do this. And, and the comment was made earlier too, uh, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel on how we do some of these things. There are a lot of great models in breast cancer and others uh, yes. that, and other diseases in terms of how to both measure experience but also how to deal with some of the communication gaps in terms of uh, how the whole team, not just the physician, is part of that. Mm. Yes, May Dr. I, Fra? Just a suggestion. Please identify yourself. Uh, I'm Pierre Ferrolla from the, in the coordinator of the scientific committee of the INET, that is the NET Society, uh, Patient Society in Italy. Um, just a suggestion, we were talking yesterday with uh, most of the representatives for the uh, center of excellence, maybe for the cooperation between the patient association, is to identify, uh, you know, in the actually in the requisite uh, is how many new patients the, the center see every year, and this is of course an index of attraction. But most important is how many patients stay over the year at the center, since we have a, a, a high volume centers that <laughs> generally do the first visit and not the, the patient don't want to stay in the same center. This is an index of quality, and also we are discussing about uh, the a questionnaire that should be developed by the patient association to be um, Subministrated to the patient that is different from what us as physician uh, may be judge. But so, uh, what is are the ethical issue? What are the uh, orient, patient-oriented uh, measure that the uh, the um, hospital can take? And this can be a, an interactive cooperation to ameliorate the quality of the assistance uh, by the patient point of view also. Ron, if I could just comment. Yeah, please. So, um, so that's an important point. I, I worry a little bit about that as a metric because oftentimes people will come from hundreds if sometimes thousands of miles away to come to Stanford for that first opinion. And we don't want to give that person monthly injections. We, don't, you know, we, we might discuss clinical trials, but it's not practical for that person going to clinical trial. And we will then use that opportunity to educate their physician as to what treatments yeah, make sense. Way. Go ahead, and, and perhaps that opportunity can grow a seed and, and, and uh, you know, result in better care locally because of that. And, and so that patient goes back, and then we see them less frequently, sometimes in at, you know, two or three year intervals, only when there's a decision to be made. But, but that's the way we do it here, but even without centers of excellence. That's yeah, the situation way. in Europe is slightly different in some countries where we have more than one center of excellence. So uh, if a, a patient say, I don't want to go again to that center, is not a good index. So, uh, so to my opinion, this should be considered in the, in the interactive role of this. Yeah, if I may comment on that, uh, I mean, the, the, con the concept of trajectory of disease is something that I think people should think about and maybe you should discuss in some detail today. So this is a tremendous variable, variability is involved in managing the disease state with net patients. No two patients are ever the same. It's hard to make a guideline where everybody is unique. I, I, I 
somebody has the unicorn foundation. I really, you know, we always talk about zebras in the United States, but when I come from in South Africa, zebras are about as common as horses. But now it's the unicorn <laughs> foundation. I really like that. But trajectory of disease is what's important. So I will very often have the same recurring discussion with patients. I've seen you maybe once, maybe even twice. But I haven't yet got a feel for how you are behaving, your own biological behavior of your disease. Where is it on the spectrum? Is it doing this? Is it doing this? Is it changing? Is it morphing into a different kind of situation? So because you can't get that concept on every patient until you've seen them for a while, and that doesn't mean they have to see the same doctor for a while, they just need to hit the healthcare system enough times over a course of a year or so to get a sense of what the disease is doing, then you can actually make a determination of this patient should be seen once a month, once a week, once a year, should be seen in the center where all the expertise is all the time or maybe occasionally. And so there's tremendous differences. And I, for example, will often share a patient with one of my colleagues in such, I will see them every year, but Ursina Teilbaum, our oncologist, one of the oncologists I work with, will see them once a year. But that means they're hitting the healthcare system every six months and we're sharing the records and we're seeing what's happening. But the patient isn't becoming a professional patient. You don't want to become a professional patient. You want to be living your life and only communicate with the healthcare system when you need to. Okay. Any other Yes, Dermot, and then another question. Piero, I thank you for that comment. I, I, you know, it is, it, it is tremendously different from one country to another as well uh, in Europe. So it's, what, what sometimes happens in my experience with the center of excellence model, it's nice to share that because some patients, once they come to a center of excellence, and, and you no, know, they've certified, so they've had their, the stamp, the, 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 the certificate is outside the, the, the office, some of them don't want to go back to uh, um, an, uh, an oncologist, a uh, general oncologist. I can respect that. I can respect it because when the patient sits down and sees the team and meets a team that are dedicated to their, their disease and to, uh, uh, and to the understanding, um, the, already I think the, the, there's a great relief, there's a lot of anxiety, even if you have to. You know, you were mentioning earlier, even if you and the comment was about even if you're breaking bad news that you have to go to a further therapy and you explain that. It, 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 there's a great sense of relief when finally the patient is oriented in, a, in, a, in, a, in an avenue or in a path that's going to be in some way positive. So there's a great, in, in, you incentivize your patient and their family in, in, to reorient and put them on the back, back on the right journey and the pathways. So that's, that's, that's my experience for some of the center of excellence. And in Ireland, it's a smaller country, but it's, it can still be as difficult to go 150 miles on some of our roads, I can tell you. But, you know, we work also with partners, and it's, it, ta it takes a tremendous amount of effort to educate um, general practitioners, but also, you know, other partners. And sometimes they don't like being told what to do. But we tell them. And... Uh, we don't tell them so rudely, we, we, you know, we, it, but it takes time and we have to, you know, we, it, there's a lot of politis, political sort of uh, little maneuvers that you, that you use, but that happens. It strikes me, though, that because of the vast, when you're talking about a global, we have to cater not just for the center of excellence model that we have in Europe where patients can just go every month or two. That can't happen everywhere, <coughs> and even within some European countries. And I think that that sort of... Um, Providing that, that, that the bridge is, is definitely an unmet need. And one of the things that we hope to do next year, to look at the, to look at the primary care, so that when da da David's patients are with a primary care physician on somatostatin analogs and there's a, a query so that you know, he doesn't have to spend another half an hour on a Friday um, a morning, is to maybe, what we focused on a lot has been sort of you know, up, up and coming net experts within the ENET structure. And we've discussed, and I hope to lead this program to um, have a more primary care focused <coughs> educational pathway with webcasts and webinars. And what we would do then is we'd make a more simplified educational program for the GPs. We call them GPs, of so any primary care physicians and the community nurses. And maybe also for, we could have a step up for you know, community oncologists so that 
they don't, they'll never go to the webinar unless the patient tells them and we give them a card so they can, they can have a look at this. So this type of thing can help the bridge that gap and it, it may be something useful to focus our attention on. So it's, 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 it's a concept. Right. And as uh, I think Dave uh, outlined, they do some of the regional programs for the same purposes exactly. of reaching out to GPs and others in those communities. So we have a question from Siobhan. Please identify yourself. Hi. I don't want to talk too loud. Um, I'm Siobhan Conroy from uh, Unicorn Foundation in New Zealand. So there's, there's the New Zealand branch and there's the Australian branch. That, and they were first, I have to, have to say that. Um, my question is moving on to um, coming up with a, a statement for standards of care, which I understand is, is difficult, and, and David, you said that early on, that it would be hard to agree on a public statement. But um, I feel really passionate about this because um, uh, we know uh, within the room there's such um, variations in terms of especially access to treatment. And I think we can't underestimate the, um, you know, what, who patients know and what they can influence in their own countries. And as an example, um, uh, in our country, the clinicians tried to bring um, GATA or Gallium 68 scans to New Zealand for years and got nowhere. And within a few months, once we started, you know, talking about it and putting the message out there, we established GATA in our country for the first time. And um, I think with um, with your organisations, we, you know, a, a statement coming from you could be re incredibly powerful in helping us in, in our own countries. And uh, you know, we're lobbying our politicians. To politicians at the moment, and if I put the guidelines, say the ENETS guidelines in front of them, they're not going to read it, you know, but if I put a quote or a statement that comes from you, they will pay attention, so it'll make our jobs easier to bring the right treatments into the countries to help the clinicians, so if it's possible, I would love it. <laughs> All right. Great, some reaction, yes. Yeah. So one of the things that affects healthcare generally is that... Uh, Particularly, I think, uh, physicians, but also patients, are a little bit reluctant to understand that we don't necessarily always need more resources. We just need to use those we've got a bit more wisely, and, and the Choosing Wisely program is in many countries. So we have to stop doing things that are unnecessary and unhelpful. And I think that's a very powerful message because everyone goes to politicians or health administrators wanting more. But if we can actually use things in a more rational way, and that was the whole impetus behind the Comnets, Nanets project of optimising what follow-up there should be after you resect. Um, on, the, on the surface, you would think everyone should be seen all the time so as not to miss anything <laughs> and have lots of tests. Mm -hmm. But actually, if that doesn't really change what happens, that's a whole lot of resources as well as anxiety for patients um, that wasn't productive. So I think that New Zealand's a very good example of rationalisation of services <coughs> and I think we certainly can help with statements of saying what is helpful but also what isn't helpful so that we're not always asking for more, we're saying we recognise that there has to be rationalisation of, of healthcare resources and we have to optimise it um, so that it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a very, very important point uh, and I think uh, choosing wisely the campaign, you know, we do it in gastroenterology and, uh, you know, it's the best example of that is, you know, do you get your colonoscopy every year and uh, or do you wait every 10 years uh, and that's 10 wasted or 9 wasted procedures, 9 procedures of risk that may not necessarily be beneficial. On the other hand, if you get that one every 10 years, you're clearly going to make an impact. But a response to yourself is, I don't want to suggest that advocacy is not the way to go. It is the way to go. It's really, really important. The work that your groups are going to be doing, I think, is going to be essential to pave the way for futuring the management and successful care for patients with nets in general. You know, if you teach a man to fish, it's a hell of a lot better than giving a person a fish, that famous old saying. So the point is, if the patients get up as a group and make statements of what they feel they want, it's really, really important. Patient-oriented care is where we're at. The patient is the center of the spoke of the wheel, and the docs are all the spokes around the outside. So yeah, absolutely, I think that uh, advocacy is essential. And I'm not suggesting 
that you shouldn't come up with a statement. I think you should. It would be great if you can. I'm just saying be, be careful of making this something that is too grandiose that's not going to be in any way practical and it's not going to work because of all the variability around it. I think it would be very important to come up with some kind of a statement. This is what we as patients want because you deserve it. And I think what, what we're after, and we'll work on this uh, for sure, is what are those powerful common denominators that we can also get the endorsement of the medical community writ large in terms of neuroendocrine. And we've said a lot of those things, and you have all said them already today. Uh, every patient is different. Uh, having a multidisciplinary team is uh, critical, but it's a journey, and things change, so it's complex. But you know, you can also help us with the message, but you're not alone, and there are people at our institutions and in our patient groups who can help you. And by helping us make those connections, we can also help you uh, in terms of making those connections. I, I want to get back to Siobhan's question, because I think what we had a chance to talk yesterday, and I promised her I would <laughs> she could hold me to it. I, I think that there is value in a professional society in making a stance on what the minimal essential elements are that each country should strive for, and then that would allow her, that would give her more weight when she argues with her politicians to get those resources. Right. And I admit not everyone needs a gallium scan, but there are certain uh, cost savings that could come as a result. So I think that putting it in terms of cost savings is always appealing to the people who are trying to limit uh, or regulate or, you know, miss their resources when they're limited. So clearly an opportunity and a challenge. Yes, please identify yourself, Giovanna. Hi, I'm Giovanna Mbezi from Los Angeles, the LACNETS group. And thank you so much for bringing us all together. There's so much to learn from hearing what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, one of the things we experience in Los Angeles is that, um, especially with new treatments being approved now, is that it's gotten even more complex, that there's a point where the patient is having to make some pretty serious decisions. And as we said, this is a, a you know, long-term thing. So we're going to come to those points more and more often, what's next and what's the best next step. So I think um, that's one area that we have of concern. We see patients who are either coming into the system for the first time, either they're being referred by a regional center, um, or they're at a point in their care where they now need to make some serious decisions. And we do have multicultural, uh, multi uh, centers of excellence, um, but sometimes it's not so clear to the patient that those resources are all available to them. So I'm wondering as, a patient, as patient advocates, how much can we help the patients understand that there is this team? Because sometimes that doesn't become very clear. And I think we do put a little too much pressure on the doctors in that short appointment. There's so many things that I find can be solved without going to the doctor, like a, a lab order or something, you know. I'm trying to keep those, that precious time to the really, really important issues. And there are other things. We would love to have a patient navigator, someone who can literally welcome someone into the system and let them know what's there for them. Um, the nurses, at least for us, are too busy to do that. Uh, they're maxed out, but maybe it's another nurse. Um, but creating a system so that there's someone to literally welcome the patient into that system. And what's been said about um, working with regional doctors, I think you said that, Dr. Fisher, that has been so effective when a doctor at a center of excellence will is willing to work with a local doctor and um, then everybody learns so okay can I comment on that uh, um, uh, Giovanna one thing you mentioned that I think is really really important not in the net world only but specifically in the net world is this patient navigator story um, I get people who come and they you know if you're seeing somebody every 20 minutes and they're 15 minutes late, you've got a real problem. And you can be 15 minutes late because you got within five miles of the place and you didn't know where to park. Simple thing. Or you got in the parking lot and there was a line to get in there. Uh, or you walked into this enormous building and it's, uh, who knows if I'm in the West Wing or the North Wing or the South Wing. And so patients who come into Philadelphia, which is, you know, 
the, the catchment area in Philly is maybe five million people. The city is a million and a half or so. We're not the biggest by any means, but people don't want to come into the big city and get all scared and lost and they don't have about the traffic. And it doesn't sound like a big thing if you're a doc that drives in every day and knows exactly what you're doing, but if you're a patient coming from outside, it's really, really hard. And knowing the difference of where the radiology department is and where the, the gastroenterologist you're going to be seeing is or you know, where you're going to get your specific test is enormous. And so the navigation becomes a real big issue. And understanding that this person is the guy that delivers the radiation and that guy is the guy who puts the scope in to see where it is and this is the person who you've never ever met and you're never ever going to meet but it's the pathologist that's going to actually read your slide and make all the difference on how you're actually going to be treated. And putting that all together is a patient advocate, uh, is a, a navigator job. And uh, we have a couple of navigators, but I can tell you that really what ultimately comes down is my long-standing nurse coordinator, Bonnie, who you know, uh, is somebody who has in her head things that I don't even know how they happen, but she makes them happen. And that's probably the most important thing for coordinating. That's the connection between the patient and the system is the navigator. Yeah, Fever, I, I still think that we have uh, too much of a traditional medical model um, and what we need to do and, and what I would think would be beneficial would be for the patient to hold their own record because the doctors will vary, the nurses will vary, but the patient is the one constant <coughs> in the centre. And I think it's, uh, you know, it is medical information so it needs to be understood for that. I, you don't want to be obsessed that your chromogranin's gone up by, you know, two when it probably, you know, shouldn't have even been measured. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, it, 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 with medical information, it needs to be put in context. But I think that we need to, I would like to see, or something you might think about is some sort of record that all of your uh, patients, that the patients could keep that has the key points of the journey and so that you feel very empowered and you know, um, uh, you know who the doctors are, who the team is, and uh, I think that that's something that I've been interested in. And and you can probably get it on, you know, make an app for your iPhone because everything else is on there. Just a, before the, I don't want to uh, hog all the questions, but the, I think that's also cultural. I, you know, when I came back to Dublin, I mean, even dictating that your consultation letter with the patient, I always do that because I, I sometimes get it wrong. And I like the patient to know what I'm saying, so I'm not, I'm not saying anything secret. But you know, in Ireland, I know that I try to get all my team to do this, and sometimes they they go, you know, well, I, I don't like dictating in front of the patients. It's extraordinarily cultural. I, I got a patient from from Stanford came back from Ireland, and uh, she came in and she said, "Oh, I I said, do you have any CDs?" And she she opened her phone, and it was direct linked to Stanford Medical. Not only with uh, all of the the blood results, we had the scans, we had everything. So, so there there is a great divide, and um, I, I agree with you. In fact, I think that I, I think there's a stakeholder, uh, and you have to empower them with the information. I think that we're often afraid, as physicians, of you know, if if you talk the jargon and explain the jargon, the patient becomes familiar with that rather quickly, actually. And uh, when you empower the patient with that, your 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 task as a as a, as a carer becomes far easier as well. So I really agree with that. But, and just one comment about the advocacy. I don't know if there's anybody from Canada here, no? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, I was in Canada recently. I went through a bit of Quebec and a bit of Ontario, and I met some really, really good groups, um, and, and people were really proactive in, in NET and, and many different centers. And, uh, but what I was struck was the, at some of the, the tumor board meetings, we went, I went and visited some tumor board meetings, and they were asking me how we would do it in Europe. And, and they said, yeah, that's what they do as well, but we can't give this because it's not reimbursed or we can't. So there were, I mean, there were so many options that they wanted to use, but because the, there was a problem in terms of uh, reimbursement mostly, or not available because it has to be part of a clinical trial, whether it was a gallium a scan or whether it was POT. So I do think that type of scenario where you're in a you know, well-resourced structure we're, we're dealing with rare diseases, so we won't have what we call these phase three tri clinical trials uh, that can go to the FDA to be approved and stamped, and then the, 
the insurer then will, will, will it, that opens the key for reimbursement. So I think one of the big things, and George was touching on that as well, so correct, unifying the thought process to empower and, and demand from states that we have access to uh, medications that, that are available in many other countries. Uh, I think that's important. It's important for rare diseases, and I think the concept of, of demanding, you know, we're not like colorectal cancer or breast cancer groups where there's so many patients and so many trials that a new line of treatment within 18 months sometimes it can be, you know, available to people. So um, we, need to, we need to work on that, I think. Right. And we've got some great, we'll have some more discussion about just what that looks like, but clearly, uh, and you heard from some of our colleagues from India and Japan yesterday, uh, in terms of the huge gaps in terms of what's available in minimum standards, but yes, but right. high level, you know, sort of almost bill of rights for what patients yes. should be able to expect uh, just, from, the, to from the healthcare that, system okay. and, of course, the, the full team, the nurses included. So, Jackie, go ahead. And yeah, then Jackie Herman from CNETS Canada. Right. Uh, I just wanted to respond to that comment that, you know, as a patient organization, we've done a tremendous amount of advocacy around trying to get, uh, you know, these things move forward so that the patients have access. But I think what we're really missing is a key partnership with some of our physicians because together we can move it forward. We've worked so hard on our own and it's really hard uh, just as a patient organization to move things forward. And we do have some uh, physicians that are very strong advocates, but it's, it's, a, it's a vast country. And uh, so we, we need a lot more partnership with our physicians and hopefully together we'd be able to to move those types of things forward. So I just Thank wanted you. to make that comment. Thank you. And the importance of the time in this dialogue is to at least take some of those initial steps, and that's what we hope to come out with at the end of today, some suggestions to work with each of you and all of you on those. Alan. Um, Alan Wilson, FIO Paratroopers. Um, I'm from a business background, and so I look at this kind of strategically. And this is a strategic partnership to me now that we're beginning to develop. It's nascent, but it's there. You have some systems in place, um, <coughs> such as audit, the audit process for um, your centers of excellence. Dermot, you're very heavily involved with that. And we talked yesterday about some of the mechanisms that might be employed to leverage that for the patients a little bit more, such as the audit trail, maybe patient questionnaires, that you're doing satisfaction questionnaires whilst you're assessing these centers. But the feedback loop that we would get and you would get from a consistent audit trail incorporating those kind of questions Simple mechanisms like that might deliver big results for us in terms of statistics as well. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is that this, this break in um, this bridge that we talk about between the, the patient and um, the physician is often filled by the nurse, we keep hearing this, or, uh, as the facilitator in the multidisciplinary teams. And I just wonder um, whether we can actually leverage that better in some way by giving the nurses a contact point more frequently, like the Stanford kind of um, information you were talking about. But the leaflet, uh, Bertram Wiedemann talked about a leaflet yesterday or something that can be given to the patient by the physician with maybe a list of criteria that you go through and, and contact points, and that would bridge a gap as well. So there's, 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 a, there's a disconnect in the information, but I think you can plug that in a little bit more. But I also take Dermot's point that ultimately as the patient goes to the physician more and more, you learn more and more and you become more in tune. So sometimes it's the initial experience that's actually the disconnect. Uh, just what are your thoughts on process and mechanisms and tools that we can work together on? I mean, I give this maybe to George. The navigation, I, I like that concept because, you know, we've got two satellite groups in, in Ireland, so having somebody part-time who's, who's a navigator, I think, is a really good thing. And, and you know, if you... If, if, if you if you create a job like that, I, th I think you can have a navigator that takes on several types of, uh, of disease processes. So I don't know what the experience is for that navigation either in, 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 in Australia or in New Zealand or in, or, in, or, in the, or in the States. But we don't have those navigators, but I think it makes a lot of sense. So one point I would make about the navigation side of it is uh, the navigator has to have some clinical expertise. Uh, and it has to be somebody who understands the concepts and understands the disease. So we have a lot of these sort of issues in our practice for all disease states is, you know, what can a secretary respond to on the phone and what can a nurse or a medical assistant respond to on the phone? And if it is anything clinical, we steer that uh, sort of law in our division 
that you, if you're going to make a clinical decision or a clinical impact statement, it has to go through somebody who's clinically trained. So these navigators are not that easy to just set up. It has, it's an expertise, and it's expensive. It's really, really expensive. And so to get our institution to, to fund navigators for gastrointestinal oncology, for example, was a real headache. And, and now we have a few, and we're growing that program, and it's, it's blossoming in many, many different areas in our institution. But ultimately, in the American healthcare system, the only thing that makes money is the patient and the doctor face to face, because that's the only billable activity. You can sit on the phone as much as you like, you can deal on the internet as much as you like, but the institution isn't going to fund it unless it's going to give them some kind of reimbursement. And so to get navigators on board is very difficult. I do, however, think it's a very good idea for the patient advocacy arm of, of this thrust to drive towards that communication between patient navigation. I think it's a very good idea you've brought up. I think it's something that you should foster because I think it really has improved the, 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 the journey for our patients because of that. Yeah, I'll just comment briefly. The, um, I think it gets back to a little bit what Ava was talking about is know your healthcare system and know the hot buttons for the people in charge of making those decisions. In the United States, the healthcare system is broken, but we know how to play it. And so it's all about, so if we appeal to administrator, it's all about pride in the institution for doing something excellent that, that can be marketed as such. Uh, number two would be cost savings. Number three would be revenue generating. So we didn't have a navigator. We didn't have gallium scans. And we convinced the hospital long before gallium was approved to let us to, to buy the generator, to let us do it for free for patients. We had, had a little bit of philanthropy to help out. But we did that because we told them how many other scans, neuroendocrine patients brought into the system, which were, were revenue generating, or how many surgeries were done for neuroendocrine patients, uh, or how, many, how much an octreotide injection is, and that was before lamreotide. So I think that you play to the, to the, uh, you know, to the administration and, and you work that to the best of your ability, and that's gonna be different in every country, and, and perhaps different states, different institutions. But we were able to convince them to give us a navigator and, a, uh, and gallium before it got approved, so. Just a quick response. Uh, no, There's yeah. a quick one. Sorry, sorry, okay. wrong. Very quick response is that we've developed an app, uh, and apps can do anything or nothing. But this particular one, it tracks your symptoms, it tracks your, um, your, your daily feelings, it tracks your medication. But it also gives a, a ping point, like a contact point in the MDT of a facilitator. So you can say, I'm not feeling well today because I ate something last night or whatever. And the physicians can respond via the facilitator if it's deemed to be necessary. But it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of, let's say, a point that's made, and they can pick up on it if they want to. Now, the problem with that is it's the quality of the team and the quality of the facilitator, but that's a <coughs> problem. But it's, it's, it's a very simple mechanism, and it's much cheaper and easier to handle. So, and, thank you. And, um, well, let's get to Dr. Lau's question again. Yeah. I'm Liao Kui <coughs> Sorry for my voice. Um, I'm from CNET Singapore. I'm a surgical oncologist practicing uh, in a private setting in Singapore. I would like to make three comments. One is the patient ownership of the clinical data, which I absolutely agree with you. Um, moving forward, I think what we can do to harmonize the world is to make sure that our patients are educated. Whenever they, con they see a patient, they must request the clinical record to be downloaded into some forms of digital storage. Now in the era of digital uh, storage, I think it is so easy to just to get the clinician to download into your thumb drive. So if you have a personal iCloud, you can download to the iCloud. I mean, I'm glad I live in the era. I'm still live true to see the iCloud in existence, that I store all my patients records in the iCloud. Even when I'm here, the patient call me, I can pull them out and see it and advise accordingly. So as a patient advocate, I think we should educate our patient to tell them that we have to move towards your personal ownership of your clinical notes. How do you do it? You can either store it in your time drive or into the cloud that you owned. So this is one comment because 
Last week, I saw a patient from Ireland, and to my horror, the patient told me that there is no single record that is released to the patient because the system, the country just doesn't allow them to take out of the hospital. So I think um, we have to move forward in a global, with a global effort to educate our patient to make sure that they have to make an effort to retrieve this clinical data to be stored in their, uh, uh, in their control. Now the second uh, comments that made by uh, Eva Sagarov, I think it is timely for us to look at patient experience. At the moment, even as a clinician like us, we only have narrative right up in our mind. And all this narrative is in patches. It's not consolidated in a so-called well uh, digestible form, you know, in a group or in a form that we can see it very clearly. We have it in the back of our mind in all experiences that the patient go through that we can share with other people. But I don't think we have a systematic way of storing it and then sharing it with a mess. So I think that is um, one thing that we should do to consolidate all these experiences, make it systematic so that it can be uh, collected in a more formalized manner. Um, this is my second comment. The third comment is um, I'm glad that uh, Comnet is making the effort to do some of the research. I probably hope to hear more about it in these meetings uh, in the later part of the day. Thank you very much. And clearly your comment about the systemization of the, the patient experience is kind of what Alan was getting at before, too. If there's a way, for instance, within the context of a, a patient audit or feedback as part of the process of centers of excellence, whatever it is. So, so I, if I could just say, yes, well, I, it's clear that we all underutilize technology and information transfer through modern techniques. And God forbid I start tweeting like our president. <laughs> But, but, uh, but uh, Alan, if you could share that app with all of us, I, I, I would be happy to take a look at it. We have three or four apps that are going through the Stanford system to find out patient reported outcomes, and, and it may be something that's unique to NET that we could, we could ad adopt at Stanford, so yeah. please do. So the, one of the big issues is privacy, and personally I think there are issues with putting records on the cloud. Um, but there are new technologies, the Bitcoin technology that the stock markets are now using where, you know, there is no one storage data stored in multiple millions of little pieces and only put together once you claim it. So I think that that is an evolving story, but there's still a lot of problems with privacy legislations in many jurisdictions. Um, so that's something that patients, I think, and advocates can really stand up and say, no, this is ours, don't, you know, your laws are actually inhibiting uh, us, not protecting us. Right. And, you know, as we get through all of these issues and we're challenging each of you with some of the our questions, I want to come back to the two-way street that uh, Dave Metz talked about before, because we want you to be, just as we will be thinking as you leave about what we would suggest we do, we want you to be thinking about leveraging your patient groups uh, how can we, George, help make the case to the administration that it's really important to the community and the patient groups that this technology be available and, and will support you publicly, et cetera? Uh, how can we provide some of the navigation, not all of the deeply clinical stuff, but if, in fact, and I, I heard some of the centers of excellence in some countries uh, are actually working with distributing information at the first diagnosis to, about patient groups that are available. You're not alone. There are other resources here and patients who know how to navigate the system. Sir. Thank you. My name is Dirk van Jan Echter, Net and Men Belgium. Um, I have a question and maybe a suggestion. Uh, if you're a center of excellence, is there any requirement that you cooperate or communicate with patient advocacy groups? A requirement uh, in written in written statement, no. But the the um, the patient information package uh, it's one of fourteen different mm -hmm. subgroup of the major groups. Uh, so there's a there's a full section on on, on, on patient involvement, and that's um, th that's something that sort of it's it's hard to 
it's hard to um, make, a, make a, a firm statement with so many different countries, etc. So what we do is at our training day, we, we talk about that, and when the auditors go and visit and uh, with, uh, with, the, um, with the accrediting body, called GSG, they're called, um, they will see uh, what, what, what the actual patient involvement is, and of course it's encouraged that they will have a, a local uh, uh, contact uh, with, with the patient group. It's not a mandatory item because it's hard to impose that. Maybe, w maybe it will be as, as we go forward. Some, 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 some countries don't have patient uh, advocacy groups in net, so... We can help with that. Yeah, of course. So, <laughs> but but okay. the, the thing is, is that I had this week the opportunity to speak a lot with the people of Antwerp. Um, we've been printing recruitment flyers, we call them, because we think we, we're not reaching out enough to our patients. Uh, that there are net patients who do not know that there are patient advocacy, uh, patient advocacy groups. And uh, we agreed now with Antwerp, it uh, was even better because we print them and with the idea to put them where the scans are taken. Because if you have a net, you will have a scan. But uh, the doctors there said, like, we're going to make a map. And everybody who was get, uh, who's get a diagnosed of net is going to get a map and you give me the flyer, we put them in the flyer, uh, the flyer in the map so that, it, I'm not saying that they have to cooperate with us because that's one step too far. But it would be nice if it would be a, a requirement that they inform the patient that there is an advocacy group. We do that, of course, and, and most of the centers do that. But I, I think what you, I like your point. I think that, you know, we're mapping it out. We've got to map it on the, on the clinician side of the, of the, of the, the center of uh, expertise in NET, uh, and we've got to join the dots with, uh, with, the, with the patient group. So it's, a, it's an important thing going forward, I agree. Yeah, so let me make two points. Uh, first of all, in terms of flyers and information, uh, I would suggest you don't reinvent the wheel here. There are many, many primers out there that have been developed by various different groups. They're not all the same. <laughs> That's the problem. They don't all have the same emphasis. But there are many people that have tried in the past to get a patient-oriented information package together that gives the whole picture. Uh, May I interrupt you on this? Yes, we have this slide, there's nothing about the disease, only about the patient advocacy group. Because there's so much information, like you said, on, right. on, on the disease itself, and, and it's, it's confusing. So this is only, you want to talk to this? <coughs> right, so there's two components to it. So part of it, is you need two things. You need the actual logistics of how to get your care to delivered and get the information that you need in the specific location that you're going and you need the information to provide the big picture so you can feel confident that the whole picture is being looked at and those two things I think do have to be addressed but I'm saying don't reinvent the wheel your one pamphlet might be modifiable for everybody and a an existing um, primer that's been put out um, may well be modifiable for use in different places. The other point I would want to make is what uh, Dermot mentioned, is your education day, did you, did, did, did you call it? Uh, so we have had a few of these, and uh, the, the, the RONS organization should be complimented on this. Across the United States, I think you do three or four a year in various strategic locations. One of them happens to be our institution. Uh, I can tell you it's a wonderful day, uh, and we've modified this to be very, very interactive and to have very little didactics. Some people in the old days would get up and give 20 lectures from 20 specialists, and you'd walk out with cross eyes and you wouldn't know where you were going. What we've now evolved it to be is, is a whole day, but there's uh, a couple of talks. Where's the research going in the institution? What's the translational research? How does it differ from basic science research? What's epidemiology research? What it, what's the difference between the patient and the global stories? That sort of stuff. But then we spend most of the time with 20 people sitting on a stage and a master of ceremonies. It usually happens to be me because I talk too much. Uh, and uh, I'll field questions and direct them to try and make sure that everybody shows the whole big picture. But education days at various institutions, I think, goes a, goes a long way to, to helping with that. So those are the, my, my two comments. Can I just, yeah, I mean, I just want to, just to say, I like your, the concept is really important. So what, what we, I'm talking, your questions for the Center of Excellence, and that's with my hat for, 
in charge of the European Center of Excellence program. So it does vary from country to country, and we obviously we encourage if, if you've got if patients and patients on the website, so they will be encouraged to give them the address of the website. That's what we do. I mean, Mark is here from 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 Dublin, and you know, with his colleagues and uh, and partners, they set up a patient <laughs> website that has been improving from time to time. We orient towards your website as well in the UK because you've got different information. So with new patients, we'll, we'll put them onto that. And that's, um, so we do, we, we've got lots of information. Uh, I, I don't know what the take up is in that, how fast patients go on to consult. Some, some people do, some people don't. But it's really important that to, I, I might take one of your flyers actually, just to be interested in seeing it, please. We're going to get to Kathy's question, but just a little uh, promo here. Uh, the last education program we had, which we had something like 17 countries tuning in live streaming, but timing is not always great. Uh, those videos are now posted. It was at Stanford, and they do a very similar thing to what David described. So just come to our website, and you can view the videos. Kathy. Thank you. Um, yeah, Kathy Bouvier, uh, Net Patient Foundation um, UK. It was just a comment about um, the involvement of advocacy in the ENET's uh, Centre of Excellence process. Um, and we were involved in a couple of the, um, of the English Centres of Excellence um, <coughs> applications for, for the ENET's accreditation. And we went along and we spoke with the auditors, um, etc., which was a really useful process. Um, and we also send out th things similar to you to sort of two to three hundred hospitals um, around the UK and then we, we knew that we had to do a patient satisfaction survey so we went on and did that just looking at obviously you know we're thinking we're doing a great job we're being part of the ENETS process we're sending out patient information to all of these hospitals and our patient satisfaction survey that we did that nearly a thousand patients in England um, alone um, answered still showed that 60 percent of those patients had not received any patient information um, and we've hand-delivered them, we've, we've gone and spoken with, with the ENETS auditors, we've been invited, so they obviously know who we are. Um, so this, it was a really surprising response and a very disappointing response when I was sitting there thinking, yeah, well, we've done a great job, you know, and we've, we've done all of this, and that there is still something that's not, that's not quite, quite working. Um, and that's with great relationships with the specialist nurses, and, and we're a really small country, so, you know, I, I know a number of the, well, all of the, the net specialists there. Um, so I just, it's just a comment of, you know, even when it's seemingly um, be, being done very well and best practice, it, it, it's still not quite enough, and, and I, it's just something for us to think about. What, what is the nature of that gap, and how do we close it? Yes, yeah, Josh, uh, any comments on that one before? Yeah. But I think that's universal, right? I mean, I think that's the big question, or this Josh Mailman, um, NorCal Carsonet, uh, Nanet's advisory board, NRF <laughs> board member, a couple other things. Nuclear medicine um, guru. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think that is one of the universal problems. The surveys that are done for after visit care that says within 15 minutes after leaving uh, a physician's office, 85% of what was said is forgotten. And of that 15%, 50% is remembered incorrectly. So that's not unique to NETS. That is a universal thing. So it's going to be hard to solve just for NETS. But maybe uh, if you can talk. But one of the things that I wanted to point out was we're talking after visit summary. So um, Dr. Fisher at Stanford, they've worked on having a NETS specific after visit summary. Um, they have them at UCSF as well. One of the things that we were able to do at UCSF is now um, our support group in Northern California is part of the after visit summary. It's actually put on the after visit summary. Doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily use it. You can't force people, you can leave them to water, can't make them drink, um, but it's there. And so that's a way to solve one of those problems is that if it's part of the after visit summary, whether it ends up as an electronic record, a printed record, maybe that's something we can work on as a universal using whatever the Stanford model is or other models of what an after visit summary should look like. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is in general patients like certainty. We like to know that there's a certain path that we all, and this is something George and I have been talking a lot more here since we've been in Barcelona and one of the things that, um, that actually Dave brought up um, on guidelines and also, you know, minimum statements, and, and that I found fascinating that, George, if you could also elaborate a little bit, 
is we usually use guidelines as the gold standard of this is what you should be following. Um, but George, you brought up last night that the guidelines really just bring up the bottom to make sure there's a minimum level of care. It actually doesn't, it actually brings down the top as well because maybe that top percentage should be dealt differently. And I think that's something that we don't completely understand in the patient community and it would be helpful when we're looking at this to know that the guidelines aren't the golden rules even though we like certainty and we like everything to be the same. We don't like the trajectory. We'd like to be stable or exactly what it is forever and I think that is a nuance that you can help us better understand. And um, I'll sit down. Great. Comments, yes. So a couple of comments. I think we tend uh, to focus very much at the time of diagnosis and that's a time when there's an enormous amount of information. So perhaps having a let's target people who are a bit further down the journey. Oh, you don't know about NETS advocacy or NETS patient groups. You know, uh, you, but you've been attending for, for a year. So um, targeting at different points along the patient journey, um, maybe those patients were given patient information, but in the enormity of what they were doing, their scan forms that come out with pieces of paper. So I think a continual strategy of engagement. Great. 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 The other thing is trying to engage the patient's family. So I've often had situations where the patient doesn't want to engage with the patient advocacy, but the family does. They want information, they have fears, they want to talk about it, but the patient may not. Um, and so I think targeting the family and having an access where the family can access, obviously not disengaging the autonomy of the patient, but having specific uh, strategies to help families maybe a specific strategy where the, the actual patient doesn't want to engage but the family does. So that could be another uh, um, area that you target. And then again, through the GP, um, in, in systems where the GP is the primary care. So I was talking last night uh, to uh, Rachel from Brazil and the, the GPs step out of all care. But in many countries, they're still the centre of care. And one of the interesting things to me is the patient can come and see you as the, the great expert and guru, but they then go and check with their GP, who probably hasn't heard of half of the things, but that's been the constant in their life and they want validation from the GP. So I think that um, you know, at all of those levels, you can try perhaps to get more traction and we need to really integrate all of those levels. Right. It's, it's I mean, to your point, it's repetition. The one time you hit them, it's like any other advertising message. You have to continually hit them throughout the... I'm sorry. No, no, no. I've... I don't want to come out as being against guidelines. I think the guidelines, yeah. gu guidelines are great. No, no, it, but, but uh, to Josh and I were talking about things last night. Uh, it, this, this kind of gets to the, how you define a net expert. I, I'm not sure I'll ever be a net expert. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of those diseases that I'm frequent, most frequently, and, and I take care of all GI cancers, I, I'm, I'm most frequently humbled by, in that I figure if this person in a, in a in a category of things that I think I understand, and all of a sudden, you know, the disease is not behaving like it's supposed to, damn it. And so I have to do something different. And, and I think that that's what makes the care of net patients challenging. That's what makes being a family member and a net patient uh, so frustrating, because not everyone fits into a category that a guideline can follow and end up with a, you know, a happy journey. I think that uh, that you have to be ready for those twists and turns, as David was was uh, remarking, and and those twists and turns. No, no guidelines can ever predict all the different variations that might occur during that journey for such a dispersed uh, group of diseases. So, so I wanted to. Uh, so just a couple of comments on your point about uh, retention and uh, reinforcement. Uh, I have for years have made, and I like doing it, I do the same thing. I dictate in front of the patient. In fact, I type, because I'm a two-finger typist, so I can't even look at the patient. I'm typing and looking at the screen, 
and I talk while I type so the patient is hearing what I'm saying. And when they walk out of the door, they walk out with my letter that's going to everybody. And I will say, this letter is going to Dr. So-and-so. Who else should we send it to? And I'm Googling addresses because it sounds great to have an electronic record, but it isn't up to date and it doesn't have all the things. And my patients actually walk out every visit with a letter in their hand to the referring doc, any other docs that have ever looked after that patient, and with my opinion and thoughts right there and what I'm still waiting on. And I think I've done a great job. And as Josh has just pointed out, they walk in the next day and they want, they'll send us a, an electronic message, can you send me my endoscopy report? And there it is in their letter. So unfortunately, I think it's just repetitive information that has to be delivered to be effective with that. So we're not alone. This is, this is, this is a universal is truth. Your, your GI clinic has the same problem. It's not a net only problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Comment from you. We're going to have no, one more question. We're going to have go to Mark first. Okay. Are you sure? Well, well, it was just the point about it. I like that. With, I like I like George's question, just stemming from yours. I mean, I agree fully. The guidelines are, you know, I, we have to have them, and we follow them. Of course, most of us follow them, and then when it goes a little bit, but you know, I, I like that because you, 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 if the patients understand the guidelines, and it's my ambition that you know nanets and enets guidelines, the patients can follow those. I mean. We talk about the algorithm. I show this algorithm now to new patients. I've been doing this for a while. And right at the start visit, so we can, and we bring it back, and they, they see the pathway. And sometimes we've got to go off that, that line. You know, there's a, there are different lines going from, from we call algorithms. They're just, they're just trails, really. And when you say to a patient, well, we're going to actually operate and take out those two lesions in the liver, and we're not going to do anything at all with the others, they can start to understand then a rationale why you're going off at, you know, a, a, an ordinary path, you know, and, and we have to do that, but it's, um, it's, um, and it's, and it's more and more frequent, so we're, it's, uh, the, we, I agree, we, we're humbled, and I think that it's, you know, at least 20% of patients where you're um, in a sort of, some sort of a center of uh, uh, looking after med patients where you're sort of deviating from guidelines, it's actually quite frequent, and I think that's important that, that we get that message out there as well, because, you know, patients in a very top class center are saying, God, what are, what are they doing? You know, and it's sort of, it's important that that, that message gets across. Yeah. Okay. So um, we were supposed to break at 1040. We're going to go a few minutes over, but I do want to get final statements for each of our guests and one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Hi, I'm Mark McDonald from the Patient Network in Ireland. Uh, I just want to pick up on some of the things that were said about the patient advocacy involvement in the center of excellence. I think that, uh, I think it, in, Oftentimes, what we as patient advocates, all we get is ad hoc inputs into, you know, the things that we have problems with, issues with from patients. And uh, I think, following on from the, the great joint symposium we had yesterday and the survey of unmet needs, I think that there's an opportunity to tr hopefully try to put something into the centre of excellence model that uh, patients and the physicians, maybe once a year or, or twice a year, that you can sit down with just a. a, a headings of four, six items, which would maybe come out of the unmet needs survey, that you can, in a formal uh, mechanism, to review these, and then you, they can become metrics, and you can see how things have progressed from year on year. So I know you, you expressed there with a, a model there where the patient would have a more stronger involvement, but that was quite a, an extensive vision to try and get there. But I think there's an opportunity in the, in the short term to, to have something. Down. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, I like you know, that and, give, and give that form a mechanism for patient groups to get an input into the, what's happening in the Centre of Excellence from the patient perspective. I like that. Great, Great suggestion. Okay, so we're going to have a chance to talk about these and some other terrific ideas that we'll surfaced here. I'm just going to ask our panelists to each uh, give us a, a closing comment uh, of encouragement, challenge, or whatever you choose. So uh, why don't we start with you, Dermot, and then we'll wrap up this part of the session. Um, all I can say, I think the word humbled is, is, is really good. I think that um, I, I, I'm still leading the center of excellence model and I think that um, there are many, many wonderful concepts. The simple one, Mark, that you just finished off with is a, it's nice. I, I know that I go, when we go back and we look at the category 13 in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in our model with patient involvement, I think we're going to populate that, um, that whole subcategory far better and um, there's some really really good concepts and ideas to 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 do 
to do a lot more work in that area. And I think also my, you know, in our center together, and uh, we got the certificate. You, we have the photo to show that. That's nice to show that. But we've got a. I think it should propel, propel us to to work closer together and more harmony, and to um, feed off each other, and uh, to 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 improve the situation. Uh, but I also think that you know I'm, I really feel strongly about this so after visiting some countries. I think that the way forward in terms of um, better education is to unify the patient groups with the representatives of the large bodies of people who really want to improve things for the patients and the families and the whole net network is to advocate and that is unify for education and for um, uh, advocacy for um, rights of access to therapy. Great. Eva? So I'd like to thank you very much for, for inviting me. I think, um, you know, I really want to congratulate you because I, I uh, am also a GI oncologist and there is no greater advocacy group in the whole of GI. I mean, breast, yes, but I think NETS is incredibly successful. And, you know, I see patients with anal cancer and they have no advocacy and it's not a terribly sexy disease, um, you know, and, and I think the work that um, has been done in net advocacy is absolutely, you know, really exceptional and perhaps, you know, could be held up as a standard for other rarer, rarer cancers. I've got an interest in global oncology and I feel that um, it would be great to work together also to look at countries that don't even have mm -hmm. any advocacy, any net resources. I think we have that responsibility as a global community of, of, of healthcare professionals and patients. Um, and I think that there's always things that we can do better. We tend to be way behind in technology often patients will be because of their backgrounds or their business have fantastic ideas for technology um, and i think you know really um, what we can achieve by all working together is far greater than the, the sum of the parts so, thank you <coughs> great well thank you also for inviting me it's been it's been an interesting discussion um, I think there's, uh, there's challenges, but there's great uh, potential. Uh, your organization, it, as a sort of federation of multiple organizations, I think is really, there's power, there's much more power in the collective uh, activity together. Uh, I would suggest that amongst all of your groups, you already have many initiatives going along and that you could potentially have the power of sharing them uh, and without having to reinvent the wheel, one group's done something that can really spread across the whole world through this, this organization. There's really a power in numbers. Uh, and I think that we, we've come to realize with time that the patient is the center of all of this. This is a patient-oriented issue. It, it's not the, the hospitals, it's not the doctors, it's not the societies. So you have a lot of power and a lot of potential and I think organization and this is a start, so uh, I think you can really go well from that. I really do want to focus on this two-way street, uh, which I've, I, I've, I've harped on. Uh, we got a lot to learn. I think the patients have a lot to learn, and together I think there's got to be communication in both directions. Um, I do want to also just mention one thing that bothers me a lot, is that I'm getting older and greyer as time goes on. And it's really hard to make the neuroendocrinologist of the future. Uh, and I think that's a real challenge. That's a challenge we have to deal with as, as professional societies. Uh, and it's something we're battling with. And I think whether you're in the United States or in, in the Commonwealth or in, in the UK, it doesn't really matter. There's the pressures are, 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 are tremendous on physicians. It's less time, less money, uh, less personal uh, uh, life. Uh, more involvement. It's a 24-hour, 24-7 life now. Uh, I mean, I get on, on the net here and I'm dealing in patients' charts, you know, a continent away from home. Uh, so how to get somebody to be attracted to doing this particular role uh, is difficult because there are many ways in. You don't have, your primary specialty varies and your interests will vary. But that's a real challenge we all have to deal with. And I think we've got to realize that the future is on us and it's, it's right here and right now. And we need to put, a, put that in the picture as well. Thank you very much. It's been fun.
Yeah, I guess I'd like to close with um, sort of accentuating the point that Ava and Josh brought up. Uh, the fact that, uh, that the information is not delivered successfully to anal cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, neuroendocrine cancer doesn't mean that we can't address it in neuroendocrine cancer. Maybe we can teach those cancers a thing or two about how to, how to address their physicians, how to get the information out. So, so don't let that dissuade you from, from being bold and coming up with sort of best practices that, that because you are a diverse federation of groups, you can learn from each other as a best practice that we can then learn from and, and apply to our different institutions. And, and of course, all centers in the U.S. are excellent, so <laughs> just ask them. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that we all strive to be better. Let me just leave it at that, and I think that you can make us a lot better. So thank you. I, kind of, I hate to do this, but we spent a lot of time interviewing a lot of people, both on the physician side as well as on the patient side, and you're coming up with your white paper. May I just suggest that that really has to be finished. You've got to write that up, you've got to make a document, you've got to distribute that document. Because right. if you don't get to the end of the pathway, then it hasn't really been for a, a successful effort. But if you do get this to the end of the pathway, you're going to have something in your hand that you can actually use. So what great encouragement from all of you, especially those last two comments. We absolutely are committed to completing our task, uh, not just for ENOTS, but for all of you in terms of our insights. Uh, and more particularly, what we think we can do. I mean, we have laid the groundwork for a very powerful and exciting partnership. You've seen it on display here. You saw it on display yesterday. Such great ideas come forward today. We're going to work the rest of the day on coming up with some priorities for action, which are also going to be in the paper, some concrete things that we can do to uh, work together. So uh, we're going to do that with the richness and the encouragement that we've gotten from all of you. So please join me in thanking our wonderful panel here today. So we're going to take a quick picture before some of them have to go to the airport. We're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we're going to reconvene and really try to work as small groups in terms of what we can do next.